Now, today, I want to speak on some ideas in the philosophy of science. I have prepared a, a few notes which I shall use, but in principle I shall speak uh, just free. Uh, the beginning of my notes was that I was afraid that my, yester my lecture yesterday was too difficult, too complicated, incomprehensible, and therefore there would not be so many people here today. Now I am very glad to see that there are, you are uh, such a large group, and um, I have to change a little bit. Still, I say what I wanted to say. I wanted to say, yesterday I was speaking about physics, and physics is just within, well, I would say still within the limits uh, which are drawn to our uh, human mind, still accessible to the human mind. Therefore, you can do it precisely. Therefore, you try to do it precisely. There you become very complicated in, ex complicated in expressing it. And I was afraid yesterday to have done precisely that, to be too complicated. As to philosophy, we may hope to be in a far better position, because philosophy is just a little bit outside of the limits of the German mind, of um, <laughs> human. <laughs> Eine Fehlleistung. Uh, <laughs> but both of the German and the human mind. And uh, just because it's a little bit outside, we have very little control about what we say, and so we can take it very easily. So uh, in general, it's far easier to talk about philosophy than to talk about physics, because how can you ever prove that you were right or wrong? Uh, still, I hope to speak about philosophy some, somewhat uh, more uh, precisely than perhaps would make it easy. Um, I have two parts of the lecture which I propose to give. The first one, the shorter one, is what is philosophy? The second, a proposed philosophy of science. It is very typical that in speaking about physics, one never begins by asking what is physics. One goes into physics immediately. Speaking about philosophy, one would ask, what is philosophy? And this means that you have already entered philosophy, because philosophy is an enterprise to which belongs also the question, what is philosophy? While physics is an enterprise to which the question, what is physics, does not belong. It is also a question of philosophy. Now, I want to speak about the question, what is philosophy, in two contexts. First, in essence, then in history, briefly. First, in essence, what is philosophy? I first give two definitions and then a little explanation of the word, and then I shall tell a few stories which may illuminate the thing better than those definitions. The two definitions are a pragmatic definition and a holistic definition, if I may use this word. The pragmatic definition can be given in different ways because pragmatic things always are expressed differently and always mean somehow more or less the same thing. I first say philosophy is reflection. The re in the reflection is important. It's a thing which comes afterwards. It is, for instance, the attempt to understand what we have already said. Or it is the attempt to say what we mean by our words or it is the attempt to know what we pretend to know. This, I would say, is a pragmatic definition of philosophy. And it, as soon as you look to uh, the man who probably, in a way, is the symbolic fic um, uh, person in the history of philosophy, that is Socrates, you find that very clearly with him. I shall say, shall say a few words about him later. The holistic definition is about the aim of philosophy, and I would try to say philosophy is an attempt at an awareness of a totality, perhaps of a complete awareness, an attempt. The word philosophy is interesting in itself. In Greek, Sophia means knowledge. It may even mean wisdom. It may even mean awareness of all we need to know. 
philosophia, which was the term which the Greek philosophers used for their own uh, activity, means love of knowledge, no love of wisdom, love of total awareness. And love here is eros. Love here means a never satisfied longing for knowledge, for wisdom, for awareness. And this is what Plato, for instance, ascribed to himself as the thing he did. He did not maintain to be a wise man, but to be longing for wisdom. Now I want to tell you two stories about the man from whom I think I got the deepest impression on what I would call philosophy. He was a physicist. It was our great teacher, Niels Bohr. Bohr certainly taught us physics, but he also taught us an attitude which I would call philosophical. While I have also known uh, professional philosophers who impressed me very much, but still Bohr, I think, was the one who, who impressed me most profoundly. Now two little stories about him, simple ones, not, not too serious. Uh, the first one is about dishwashing, and I have told it many times. So forgive me if you know the story already. Uh, when, uh, Heisen when I was quite young, Heisenberg invited me for skiing into his ski cabin in the Bavarian Alps, and next year he invited also Niels Bohr. Bohr came with his son Christian, he came, and Felix Bloch also came, so we were five. And we were living on that little primitive ski cabin, and we did all the homework ourselves. For instance, Heisenberg did the cooking, and Bohr did the dishwashing. Now, Bohr was very modest and never satisfied which, with what he did in science, <coughs> let alone philosophy. But he was quite proud of what he did with his hands. So looking at his work, he said, looking at some glasses in which we had been drinking port wine, which he liked very much, uh, he said, no, after he had done it, done, uh, done the, the washing, well, that with, a dirty, with dirty water and a dirty cloth, you can make dirty gla glasses clean. If you would tell that to a philosopher, he wouldn't believe it. <laughs> now, this was a concept of a philosopher, which I think was a philosopher not as good as Bohr was as a philosopher. Uh, but this was the professional philosopher about whom he was speaking, and it is very characteristic of philosophy that they always, always have stri strife with each other. Second story, quite similar. Uh, in uh, I don't know exactly which year, but not very far, very long after Bohr had given his famous Como lecture in which he had introduced his interpretation of quantum theory, which then was called the Copenhagen interpretation, together with Heisenberg's interpretation. Uh, Bohr was invited to go to a symposium of philosophers of the Vienna School of Positivism, which was held in Copenhagen in order to tell them the new philosophical consequences of quantum theory. He went there and he came back to the institute somehow nearly completely broken, not at all happy, not at all happy. We asked, what's the matter? Oh, those philosophers. Well, what did they? Well, they agreed all with me. Now, what can be bad with that? Well, if somebody for the very first time hears about the quantum of action, and is not completely confused, he hasn't understood a word. <laughs> now, what did this mean? It meant the following. The Vienna positivistic school were those people who were convinced that all our knowledge comes from experience. And Bohr was a great physicist, and from experience he had deduced all the things he told them, so they had definitely to, uh, to uh, believe it and to admit it and to agree with him. This was very simple. But Bohr said, the difficulty is just that I myself don't know how such things can come out of experience. And even, to be frank, I don't know what I mean by experience. How is experience possible? What does, what does that mean? And these people just didn't ask these relevant questions. And that's why they all agreed with me. So here, the true philosopher 
was speaking about those philosophers who had not well understood Socrates. And I would have said Boer was, in my mind, a reincarnation of Socrates. Now I might tell so many stories on Socrates, but you can read all that in Plato and, or in Xenophon, but mainly in Plato. And I should just say that Socrates, as he was presented by Plato, was a man who started talking to anybody and the, this other partner said something and Socrates said, oh, how interesting. You certainly understand the thing you have been saying. Please explain to me because I do not yet understand it. And then they continued until in the end the other person had to admit that he hadn't understood it either. <laughs> and then Socrates said, oh, how bad. I knew that I didn't know it, but I thought you knew it. But you don't seem to know it either. But tomorrow we are going to continue. And that's philosophy. <laughs> well, I mean, that's just a description of how I feel about, feel about the essence of philosophy. And you see, this is not easily done by strict definitions. Now I come to history. I come to the history from which all these definitions arise. And I shall only speak about two steps in history. I cannot talk too long about that. Greek philosophy and modern philosophy of science. Only those two. First, Greek philosophy. Well, I would say philosophy, as we use the term in the Occidental tradition, is Greek philosophy. It was invented by the Greeks. And it is clearly different from all Eastern wisdom, for instance. While Eastern wisdom may be something of the highest achievements in uh, human thought, still there is something characteristic about Western philosophy, which I think is of Greek origin. What happened? The Greeks, as all other nations, had mythology. They had myths. And these myths gave them an awareness of a totality in the world and in human life. These words are carefully chosen. An awareness of a totality in poetic language, more or less. Then came Greek rationalism, the so-called sophists, and destroyed the myths saying, but all oh, this is fairy tales. That's not true. And then came the great philosophers, for instance, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, and they tried to restore the total awareness in a thoroughgoing rational manner. That's what they tried. And then I would say the great paradigm which they followed and which was not available to the other cultures at that time at least, was deductive mathematics. Deductive mathematics was invented by the Greeks in the more or less the same time in which they invented philosophy, and the two influenced each other very deeply. Mathematics had been existing before. Babylonians had good mathematics. But <coughs> mathematics as a deductive system was an invention of the Greeks as far as I know. And this gave, made a profound impression on philosophers. And from there on, there was a tendency in philosophy to formulate philosophy clearly, precisely, with concepts, using logic, using deduction, and therefore in a hierarchical structure. The idea became more and more prom prominent that in philosophy, you have to start by something which cannot be doubted which cannot possibly be doubted, and to continue from there downwards. As mathematics in the Euclidean term, terms, for instance, looked. This was stronger in modern times than it was with the Greeks, because the Greeks, as mostly the inventors of a thing, knew also the weaknesses of such an approach. While 2,000 years later, the tradition of uh, philosophy which came from the Greeks was taken far more naively and therefore far more strictly. Now, again, I cannot speak about all these details of history, but uh, it would be very interesting to go into the detail. But then I would not come to the philosophy of science. So I leave it at that for the moment. I just say that in modern times, in the so-called age of reason, in enlightenment, when the idea of a completely deductive philosophy was very close to the hearts of philosophers. I mentioned Descartes, Spinoza, in a way also Leibniz, in a way also Kant. There came the other 
uh, attitude which said after all these philosophers tell us nothing, we can't believe it, they are very uh, confident, but in fact what does it help? And what we really need is experience. So there came the empiricist movement against it. And this was strongest certainly in English-speaking country, countries, first in England and Scotland. And uh, empiric modern philosophy of science has its origin in this empiricist counter-move against traditional philosophy, which was called metaphysics. And so I shall try to speak a little bit about the modern philosophy of science. I make a distinction, first speaking historically, on philosophy of science as we find it today, and then I shall speak about that particular kind of philosophy of science which I personally would like to propose. These two things are different. First, modern philosophy of science. Philosophy somehow seemed to be a failure, at least metaphysics. Science was immensely successful. And philosophy of science is in the strict sense reflection, in the sense that it tries to understand why science has been so successful. It is an attempt at explaining science which already exists, not at founding science in order to, to do it later on. And this can then be divided into several schools. And these schools all, I think, come from some elements in science which are certainly present. First, I think one can speak of two groups of sciences. One group is mathematics and logic, which I should call structural sciences, sciences on abstract structures. And secondly, empirical sciences, that's all the rest physics, chemistry, biology, and all that, perhaps even including human sciences, like sociology, psychology, and then the question is, and what about the humanities? Where is history, for instance? So these are systematic questions to be answered. Now, uh, how can we uh, understand the different schools in philosophy of science, which certainly exist and have existed for quite a while? I would say empirical sciences are not studying abstract structures, but they are studying what we call reality, real things. This thing here, for instance, or my nose in biology, in medicine. And uh, studying reality, we must know reality, and we know it by experience. That's very simple. So reality and experience are two guiding principles. Structural sciences like mathematics seem not to need experience. They seem to understand abstract structures before you have experience about them, a priori. So we have three schools in the philosophy of science. Empiricism, with the emphasis on experience, Realism, with the emphasis on the concept of reality. A priorism, with the emphasis on things which you can understand without needing sensual experience, at least. Perhaps with some mental experience, if such a thing exists. And I might perhaps add a fourth group, again a little bit different, linguistic philosophy, which is uh, resting on the fact that science is certainly communicated in language, and perhaps it is even found by use of language, not without language in any case. Now, I'll speak only of the three first ones in the moment. I would say all these different schools, including linguistics, uh, philosophy certainly, are pragmatically very useful. You can learn a lot from their <coughs> considerations. Yet their strife against each other, which is a typical ph phenomenon in the history of philosophy, repeated again and again. This, I think, rests on the fact that uh, they still try to re-establish some kind of absolute truth of precisely the nature which metaphysics had tried to offer, only on a different foundation. And then they will never be able to agree about what is the foundation because I think this attempt in itself cannot be successful. 
I would even say as soon as they try to re-establish absolute truth, every single one of them becomes a lot of nonsense. Uh, and this is what Bohr was criticizing, exactly this. Now, uh, the question is how I can say that in a little bit more detail, not very long. Em exper em uh, uh, empiricism. Nobody would deny that all our real knowledge refers to experience. Real, I mean, <coughs> knowledge about reality, whatever I may mean there. But it is certainly impossible to logically deduce general laws like those of physics from special experience. This is logically not possible. This was clearly understood by David Hume. It is clearly understood by Karl Popper, clearly understood by Kant, clearly understood by Plato. It's a very old understanding. Uh, and therefore, the attempt to found science on strict logical deductions from experience cannot possibly be successful. The most heroic attempt at doing that, I think, was made by Rudolf Carnap. My personal view is that he failed, but I cannot discuss that in detail today. I read him quite carefully. Second, realism. Well, knowledge means to know something real, as I said before, and in this sense, the word real, reality, is an absolutely meaningful word. But as soon as I come to the school of realism, I wonder what they mean by realism, what they mean by reality. And I cannot avoid, I cannot escape the impression that what they mean is just the preservation of certain prejudices of classical physics. And in this sense, then, I say it cannot be done. We must also be very critical with respect to the meaning of such terms like reality. This also must be done. Number three, a priorism. Well, in the tradition of Kant, perhaps. Kant had a wonderful idea to which I shall come back afterwards. He said, as to Hume's problem, that experience is not sufficient for deducing laws. How can then laws be valid at all? Well, one possibility is that the laws express nothing more than just the preconditions of experience, the conditions without which experience would not be possible. Then there would either be no experience, or if there ex ex is experience, these laws would be found to be valid in experience. This was Kant's idea. Now, uh, I think this is a good idea, and I shall try to use it, but only as a heuristic principle, not as a truth a priori, not as a necessary truth. As soon as people tried to formulate precisely a priori necessary truths, in general, one century or two centuries were sufficient to prove that this certainly was not, so, was not even true, uh, let alone a priori true. So I would say that all these uh, concepts, these schools in the philosophy of science are partial truths, and I have tried, after having studied them to some extent, I have tried to frame my own views on that, and I'm going to tell these own views now. This I'm going to do in six steps. First, A, I can say, as I sh shall speak a little bit about my method, the method I propose to use. B, mathematics, very briefly. It would deserve a whole lecture, but I, I cannot do it now. C, physics. There I shall refer to some things I said yesterday on quantum theory. D, the mind, whatever we mean by the word mind. I'm going to speak about that. E, biology, and F, human sciences. So you see, I speak of the sciences with respect to their subject matters. And this is already entering into the problem of method. I think it is impossible to formulate a general scientific method to have a methodology before you do science. You have first to do science and then to explain how this particular science applies to the particular subject matter of which you are speaking. This is necessary, else I think we get nowhere. Now, as to the method, 
I do not believe in any hierarchical structure of philosophy as it was traditional. I follow as to science, as to the philosophy of science, first in a descriptive manner, the description given by, for instance, Thomas Kuhn in the history of science, or even more precisely a description which Werner Heisenberg, my teacher in physics, gave of the history of science even before Kuhn. Kuhn says there is a sequence of two different ways of doing science, which you can discover again and again in the history of science, normal science and revolutions, plateaus and crises. He speaks of a change of paradigm. Heisenberg described it slightly differently. He said the crisis, which he knew very well, the revolutions, say the transition from Aristotle, transition from Aristotelian physics, which was very good, to Galilean, Galileo's and Newton's physics, which was more successful in certain fields, or the transition from classical mechanics to relativity, or the transition from classical mechanics to quantum theory, of which I have in a way been speaking yesterday. I spoke of quantum theory, but not of that transition. Uh, these transitions are always transitions from what Heisenberg called one closed theory, in German, abgeschlossene Theorie, to another closed theory. And a closed theory is not the final theory, else it would not be possible to go to another one, but it means a theory which cannot be further improved by small changes which contains a certain set of concepts and is very good in the frame of these concepts. And the new theory creates completely new concepts and also explains the success of the earlier one. This is at least so in modern times. Uh, Galileo and Newton did not explain the ex success of Aristotle, but certainly relativity and quantum theory explained the success of classical mechanics. Now, this is a description. Uh, and I would say, what is the connection of philosophy with this progress of science? I would say in normal science, philosophy is a nuisance. In, uh, in normal science, you can write 10 good papers while uh, in, uh, on science, and you can, get a, you can uh, get a chair of physics for that, or the science, whatever science you choose, while at the same time, with the same effort, you can write one half paper on the philosophy of science, and it will still not be good. So, uh, to, in normal science, philosophy is just too difficult and not be precisely on the way of science. Be but this is true because normal science is not interested in knowing what they do. The scientists in normal science learn what they have to do. They are able to apply it, but they are not able to answer the questions, even in general, not even able to pose the questions about the foundations of what they are doing. And that's what Kuhn describes by the word paradigm, just an example how you do it. In revolutions, it is quite different. In there, Heisenberg had a very good description. Heisenberg said, only a true conservative can be a true revolutionary. This may even be so in politics, who knows? But uh, I'm not speaking here on politics. Uh, in science, I think he is absolutely right. Only the one who loves the existing theory, now speaking about theories, or the existing set, existing set of concepts, can suffer profoundly by discovering that it is not sufficient, that it is perhaps even self-contradictory. And only this suffering opens to him the view onto the loophole through which he must go in order to find a new closed theory, that is, to do a revolution. And uh, I would say this suffering is what deserves the name of philosophy. Because philosophy evidently is a kind of suffering because it is never completed. You ask questions, you have some answers, which only open up new questions, as I described in Bohr and in Socrates. 
Now, I would say personally, uh, in methodology, philosophy is not a hierarchy of concepts, and, but philosophy moves in circles through a garden, through the garden of possible knowledge, and it goes backwards, step by step. What did I say? What was presupposed? It's reflection. Instead of going forward to the things, backward to an understanding of what has already been done. This is what happens in philosophy, I think. And I would say, I call that perhaps slightly artist, uh, artificially, not systematic philosophy, but horticultural philosophy. And I also want to say we are doing philosophy today. That means not in the past. It is not necessary that we accept past philosophy, but we ought to understand it. We are doing philosophy today, not in the future. We cannot know in advance what will be very important in the future. We are not doing philosophy in eternity. We are doing it now. That's the methodological view which I take. But we may acquire what I would call a holistic awareness just by this circular movement, because we go more or less through the whole garden and we get some awareness. Awareness is not quite the same thing as things which you can express verbally in propositions. Now I come to B, mathematics. Mathematics is very necessary, especially in my field of theoretical physics, and therefore it's very important to reflect upon it. But I cannot do it at length. I just make a few statements. Mathematics, I would say, is the art of abstract structures. I call it an art. All science, in a way, is an art. But what do I mean by art? For art, I would give the definition, art is perception of forms by creating forms. The two things. You must perceive the forms, and that's what is the Platonic tradition, and you must make them in order to perceive them, and that's the pragmatic tradition. And only if you combine the two will you have a description of what is done in art, and I would also say in science. So the battle between these two philosophical schools, again, is a battle between two who ought to be allies and not adversaries. Then I would say, Abstract structures, like those which are the subject matter of mathematics, are perceived in mathematical intuition, whatever they do, this word may mean. They are proved by logic. And I would call logic the mathematics of truth and falsehood. But again, these are only words, and I could speak at length about it, but I don't do it. Deductive mathematics, which uses logic, and which was the, was the great paradigm for philosophy with the Greeks, I think discovers superstructures in the garden of mathematical structures. It is not clear that all of mathematics can be arranged hierarchically. hierarchically. Most of the attempts at doing that have failed, for instance, by Russell's paradox. And uh, so I would say a deductive mathematics is a structure as all other structures which we discover in mathematics, but a very large one, a superstructure. I use this term because I must use it later on again. Now I come C to physics. I called physics yesterday the hard core of science. In the next lecture, I'm going to explain more in detail what I mean by hard core. I cannot do it at this moment. I call fundamental physics the set of universal laws which are valid in all science. And in this sense, I think I am what people call a reductionist. I don't think it is necessary to go beyond the laws of physics. But I am going to explain what I mean by that. The question is what we reduce to. Now, this is just a heuristic attitude. It is not a position for which I would claim to have a proof, but that's a description of the position I take. Quantum theory, I said, yesterday is the hard core of present-day physics. 
I tried to explain yesterday that quantum theory might even imply position space, relativity, cosmology, particle physics. But here is a philosophical problem, which I did not mention yesterday. For a mathematically trained reader, you can write down the basic postulates of quantum theory on one page of print. But there may now be more than a billion single empirical facts which obey the laws of quantum theory, and not a single one which would have convinced the physicists that it is not in accordance with quantum theory. And this is amazing. How to explain this universal validity of a few laws? And it's, I think, a philosophical attitude, not just to accept that and to say, well, it's like that, but to try to understand how it can be possible. I say this is a special, special case of Hume's problem. Past experience does never logically imply that the same rules will hold in the future. I said that already. So how can we justify our belief in laws, which will also hold in the future, which enable us to make predictions, which in general are successful? And if they are not successful, it was always our fault. We did it in the wrong way. Uh, well, I was fascinated long ago by Kant's answer, which I already quoted, laws hold necessarily as far as they are preconditions of experience. While I cannot possibly accept Kant's system, which is obsolete, I tried to use this idea as some guiding principle in looking for a better understanding why quantum theory should be so successful. Now, I explained that in detail yesterday, and I cannot repeat it now. I should just point to a few things which I used yesterday. First one, the first precondition of experience is time. Time is there before physics. And you cannot hope to explain time by physics. What you can achieve is only semantical consistency, that physics speaks about time precisely in such a manner which is in accordance with what we know about time already before. I give an example. Precondition of experience is time. Experience means to learn from the past for the future. That's what we do in experience. Past events are facts. Now I say, as far as we know today, I said it yesterday, the concepts of realism apply to past events. Realism is really a philosophical view which is framed looking at past events as an example. They are facts independent of our knowing them. That's at least as far as we know to be, to, today a truth. Future events, however, are known to us only as possibilities. A quantitative description of possibility is probability, as I said yesterday. And therefore, I feel probabilistic quantum theory is a set of laws about what we know today on predictions for the future. And in this sense, the understanding of words like fact and possibility, like past and future, is a precondition for understanding what we do in physics. Now, this is... Uh, However, I'm not saying this is the final theory. I would say it is a, the a theory on human knowledge. As we see it at the end of the 20th century of the Christian era, which means today. Uh, this I also say to give an answer to a possible criticism of my own philosophy of science. This criticism would say, you said you do not believe in a hierarchical structure of our knowledge, and now you introduce quantum theory as an absolute super theory. How do these two, these two views go together? Then my answer is, quantum theory may very well be the expression of a superstructure in empirical science, which is in a certain way analogous to the superstructure of mathematical axioms, simple mathematical axioms, with respect to the possibility of deductive mathematics. But it is open to further discussion. 
It is not by being a superstructure already the absolute truth. This is how I would describe this situation. Now in more detail, I just quote things I said yesterday. I formulated yesterday two basic postulates of physics. First, the existence of separable, empirically decidable alternatives. Second, indeterminism. I said yesterday that the first postulate of the existence of separable alternatives is on the one hand a precondition of science, a precondition of conceptual thought. Without that, we would have to speak about all things at the same time, which is impossible. We must separate the problems. On the other hand, this existence of separable alternatives is not strictly true. Even quantum theory shows very clearly that it is not true. So science rests on an assumption which science itself must know is not completely true. Science is not better than that. Yesterday, in the discussion, I mentioned one point, and I announced that I would speak about it today, where I go beyond the view of Niels Bohr, which is very hard for a Copenhagen scholar like myself. Uh, but I go beyond Bohr's view. Bohr speaks of what he calls the detached observer, called it like that in his later years at least. That means the observer describes the world, but he does not describe himself. He is detached in that sense from the object of his description. And this was very important for Bohr. Now I say, Abstract quantum theory, as I proposed it yesterday, might, however, admit the observer applying it, abst applying abstract theory, abstract quantum theory to his own mental states. This is not imminently impossible in, quant in abstract quantum theory. This I do not say because quantum theory might be applied to the brain. That's not at all what I'm speaking about. That's a different question. Abstract quantum theory is just intended to be applicable to any empirically decidable alternative. That's how I formulated it. If I am able to ask an empirically decidable question on my own state of mind in the future, for instance, shall I be satisfied with my lecture when I have finished it or not? If I am able to formulate such a decide, empirically decidable question on my own state of mind, then the abst nature of abstract quantum theory does not at all exclude that it would be uh, subject to the very general laws of abstract quantum theory again. So the application of abstract quantum theory to the mind, there's nothing to be said against that from the point of view of quantum theory. Of course, there are objections to this idea, two at least. One is pragmatic, the other is an objection of principle, and they must be discussed. Pragmatically, it is clearly impossible for me to predict my future states of mind by actually solving some kind of Schrodinger equation. That's evident. The mind is just too complicated for that. But this is so for many other cases, like the iron spectrum or turbulence in hydrodynamics. So this is not specific to the mind, only the mind is perhaps even a little bit more complicated than the weather. Uh, and it does not mean that these cases would in principle be outside the realm of quantum theory, only we cannot solve the equation. So this is not an objection of principle, it just says we cannot practically do it. The other one is an objection of principle. It says that in the mental processes, the approximation which we always do in subdividing the processes into separable alternatives, which is artificial and not completely <coughs> true, this approximation as applied to mental processes is probably particularly bad. What can I express about my mental processes by yes, no decisions? Whenever I read a poem, is that reducible to a yes, no decision? Or when I say a friendly word to somebody? So uh, it is quite possible that the mind is an object 
especially inept, or how do you say that in English, unapt for a description by uh, decidable alternatives. That's an objection of principle. But this would, this would mean that we might never be able, even conceptually, to submit the mental reality to a rational description in concepts. If rational means just admitting yes-no decisions. But this objection is again, in some sense, only pragmatical, because strictly speaking, this objection also applies to the description of any physical object, as I said in my remark on the first postulate of quantum theory. So in fact, this is only a strong case of the shortcomings of the way in which we do science in general. And so these two objections do not exclude mind from my considerations if I try to do it carefully. Now, what is the philosophical meaning of that? Here I would say this consideration does not necessarily imply, but it does admit a philosophy which is completely monistic and completely holistic. And I must explain this, these two words. Monistic comes from Greek monos, which is single, unique, and holos, which is total, which is whole. Monistic, no distinction of matter and mind is any longer presupposed in what I said. I just didn't introduce it and I don't need it. What would this reductionism reduce the phenomena to? Certainly not to some primitive idea of matter like little billiard balls or so, not at all. It would, for instance, permit, not imply, but permit a spiritualistic monism. For instance, as expressed in the idea of the German philosopher Schelling, who said, all is spirit, and nature is spirit, which does not yet know himself as spirit. Everything is spirit, but nature is spirit which doesn't know himself as spirit. That would be completely um, uh, in agreement with quantum theory while not following from it. So this reductionism would be a spiritualistic reductionism. And in this sense, I have no objection to it. Now, what is holistic? Quantum theory is necessarily holistic. The phase relations, which today are mostly called einstein podolsky rosen relations, because Einstein in his famous Gedankenexperiment showed very clearly what they meant. These phase relations connect all objects into always a combined object, and so if you apply them to all objects in the world, they connect all objects into one. If quantum theory is taken literally, it can only speak of one object, if it can speak of an ob object at all. And then this total object, if it exists, might be called the universe. But I'm not so sure that such an object ex exists at all. In any case, that would be the only way of speaking about it. Now, combining monism and holism, you might speak of the one spirit. And this is what Platonism does or what in India Vedanta does. So it is very close to some forms, great forms of traditional philosophy. The one spirit, of course, is no longer an object. The one spirit is the subject. Quantum theory would break down, certainly, before it reaches an attempt at describing the one spirit. It is absolutely clear in those traditional philosophies that this can no longer be described in conceptual terms, certainly not by quantum theory. And I say this is not excluded by quantum theory. I am not saying that this is my philosophy. I would have to do two things before presenting a definite view on what I have been saying here. First, I would have to do a very difficult thing in physics. I would have to discuss the measuring process as it would be described in a quantum theory which includes the observer. And I think this has never consistently been done. 
in such a quantum theory, probably, probably, the brain would be something like a classical limiting case of the mind, or like the surface of the mind which an outward observer can see, <coughs> just in order to say how I would handle the problem of matter and mind in such a, an attempt. But that would have to be done in, within quantum theory, and it is not done. I have not done it. Secondly, I would have to discuss classical metaphysics, which I quoted just now, in the light both of cultural history and of modern analysis of time. Forgive me for not offering such studies in this lecture. Uh, thus, I can only say quantum theory is open to a confrontation with spiritual traditions. I cannot say more than that. I come to the last points which I can treat pre briefly after having said what I wanted to say here, biology and human sciences. As to biology, having heard me discussing quantum theory in this light, you will not be surprised that I have no hesitation against subsuming biology under the universal laws of physics. What is characteristic of organic bodies is evolution. That means history. And the increase of the amount of form is characteristic. The increase of the amount of form which happens in evolution, increase in the, of information, in this history. Now I think I have proved somewhere else, not here, that this increase is a necessary consequence of the structure of time as I have described it, possibility versus fact. It is as well a necessary consequence of this structure of time as the second law of thermodynamics, a thing which I also did not explain yesterday, and I'm not going to explain today, is a necessary consequence of this structure of time. While I think it is impossible to consistently, consistently explain it without that. Increase of organic information, I maintain, is not opposed to the increase of entropy, because entropy does not necessarily mean disorder. That's a popular way of speaking about it but that's not strictly true. But I lack the time now to explain that in detail. In evolution, I say mind or consciousness or whatever word you choose here arises from the deep sea of unconscious behavior. There is a phrase, consciousness is an unconscious act, which I like very much. I have tried to find out who invented it. It may be going back to the German philosopher Edward von Hartmann in the 19th century or to William James in America a little bit later. This at least describes the problem which we face here. But again, I must leave it there. And I come to human sciences. It is clear that the view which I propose here includes human beings into our description of nature. We are children of nature. But we must well understand the circular movement in our philosophy. Nature is older than man, but man is older than natural science. In human cultural history, we describe the slow formation of those concepts which we use today in describing nature, from mythology through metaphysics to modern science. And so, our knowledge of nature presupposes human history. And our own human history presupposes the history of nature. And this is a circle which we cannot evade. I have, uh, we must move, I think, through this circle in order to understand it several times. I have tried to do that in two books long ago, which I can just quote. Both of them are translated into English. Whether you can still buy them in bookshops, I don't know. One, The History of Nature, English, I think, in 1950, Chicago University Press, and The Relevance of Science, English, 1963, uh, printed in England. I only mention this problem here. 
Now, as to the human sciences, I admit that I stay slightly skeptical about the scientific aspirations of sciences like sociology or psychology. A physicist, and I am a physicist, I have to admit it, a physicist is not easily impressed by complicated statistics and dubitable empirical laws. The subject matter of these sciences is, of course, the most important one for us as human beings, and I'm profoundly interested in them. But the degree of complication is very high, and their scientific stature can again and again be drawn into doubt. And I have to confess that I am far more deeply impressed by the classical humanities, by the art of interpretation, which in general is not called science. In German we call it Wissenschaft. In English it is not called science. I can give an argument from information theory for this predilection. It is informationally plausible, I say, that the messages of an emitter will only be adequately received if the receiving system has at least roughly the same degree of complexity as the emitting system. How else could it receive the complete message? But if this is so, a human person can only be understood by another human person, certainly not by being projected onto the simplifying pattern of some generalized laws. And in this sense, I think the idea of reducing human sciences to sciences of laws uh, is just a misunderstanding. It is very good to some approximation, and I fully use it, especially in economics. But I would say that in principle, to understand human behavior, human acts, it is necessary to be human and not just to be in possession of the knowledge of certain laws. I give an application. In physics, we have laws which we can strictly formulate. In physics, just therefore, we do not read the original works of earlier physicists. We just use their results. Philosophy belongs to the art of interpretation. In philosophy, we must be able to understand the work of individual philosophers, else we do not become aware of the real problems. When I was teaching philosophy for 12 years, I just read three philosophers thoroughly enough to feel that I was permitted to interpret them. That was first Kant, then Plato, then Aristotle, and then I stopped because I did something else. Uh, and since I ought to have understood far more philosophers, you see why philosophy is out of the reach of the human mind. This is what I said in the beginning. Thank you. Yes. Well, are there questions? I would be fully prepared. Yes. Uh, I'd like to ask you a question concerning the possible or pragmatic function of philosophy of science. Um, is there, in, view, in uh, your view, or can philosophy, in uh, your view, uh, contribute to advance systematically uh, science uh, in the sense, uh, is it possible to extract some uh, best or optimum philosophy of science which working scientists ought to follow. I'm, I'm thinking of the fact that um, when you uh, consider the uh, history of modern physics, for instance, uh, the philosophical views of the great scientists seems to be very scattered and uh, there's no common denominator. Well, well, I would say, I return here. I go there for hearing and I go here for speaking. Uh, my reaction is, I think philosophy is not there in order to give prescriptions for what scientists ought to do. Uh, when I spoke about the two types of science, normal science and revolutions, I feel that in normal science you don't need philosophy. You just solve your special problems and that's very good and very necessary. While in revolutions you need philosophy, but you will not know in advance which philosophy you need. 
as it would be far simpler. And when you look at the, at the great scientists who did some revolutions, who produced some revolutions, you find that all of them were in a way very philosophically minded, but in general their acceptance of existing philosophy made it rather more difficult for them. They had to do the original work of a philosopher of finding some new ideas themselves. I think you would be able to say so about Newton and his con great contemporary Leibniz. Also Galileo, who criticized Aristotle, sometimes very badly, he didn't understand him, but he needed this criticism of Aristotle in order to frame his new concepts. Similarly Einstein, similarly Bohr, similarly Heisenberg. In this sense, I would say the uh, task of philosophy there is not a philosophical prescription to science, but the philosophical mind, which is trying to reach the necessary awareness. That's my impression about the problem. Other questions? Okay. One reason we try to uh, make laws in social sciences is to achieve some uh, degree of intersubjectivity. Do you feel that I mean, following your view of social and human sciences, do you feel that intersubjectivity is something we shouldn't aspire to? That's very good. I mean, uh, I would say intersubjectivity is a wonderful thing if we can achieve it. The question is to which ex extent we really achieve it. Uh, and as, I mean, I have, been living, I have been living with physicists for 26 years, or I don't know exactly how long, I think it was 26, and I have been living with philosophers and in general with people from the humanities for 12 years, and then with social scientists for 10 years in my institute. And my view was that social scientists could very well talk to each other, certainly, and their concepts were very useful, but the positive statements they made were in general either not precise or not relevant. And this is not an objection to their enterprise. Would you include game theory in conflict forschung, for example, in, in that non precise? Well, I mean, conflict forschung is a thing I know a little bit, and I would say they are, I have never seen just speak about peace research, which is a more friendly term. And I have never seen a group of scientists, or whatever you call it, who were so uh, full of mutual uh, strife, partly even hatred, than peace researchers. <laughs> and for very, very good reasons, because the topic they treated is so extremely important. And therefore, you get necessarily emotional. And if you don't get emotional, you see nothing. Emotion is a help for seeing something. But at the same time, it makes that kind of intersubjectivity very difficult. And I would say true intersubjectivity is just to love your neighbor, to talk to him even if you disagree. And one of the kinds of intersubjectivity which I have tried to practice, at least uh, to uh, felt I ought to, was always, I should not criticize a position before I have learned to act as the advocate of that very position. And when I've learned that, then I'm permitted to criticize it. That's a kind of intersubjectivity which is possible. But laws, I mean in economics, I would admit there's quite a number of well-established law-like statements. In sociology, I'm less convinced. And even in economics, it's well known that there's disagreement on many questions between the different schools. I have a son who is an economist, and if he were here, he would agree. <clears throat> questions? Well, I can still stay here. That's, that's not the problem. There was some... Well, I solved all problems, evidently. Yeah. <laughs> I'll throw one. If we are in a plateau of quantum theory now, do you have any gut-level feeling or breakthrough that might be 
some place on the horizon. <laughs> well, first answer, it is not evident that there will ever be another closed theory beyond quantum theory, and I give you a very simple argument for that. Uh, we have seen three closed theories, I think, in this century, if I take special relativity, general relativity, and quantum theory. And perhaps we might achieve a fourth one with uh, particle physics, I'm not sure. Consider that mankind becomes more rational than today and continues to live, and that we live for another million years. And we should have three new basic closed theories every century. I can't imagine that this will happen. There might very w well be a last one. And I'm not sure whether perhaps quantum theory is already so abstract that it is, it is the last one. But I'm not saying I know that. Now as to the next step, what I did try to explain yesterday in my lecture was an attempt I make myself, which is at least not identical with quantum theory as it is traditionally taught, while it never contradicts quantum theory. It just tries to develop it further. Beyond that, I have no perception of, possible, of a possible necessity for going farther. Uh, I have not seen uh, that quantum theory is in any way self-contradictory, especially thinking that the uh, problem between quantum theory and relativity, which today is not solved because the uh, singularities ought to be removed, might very well be solved just by introducing relativity in the way which I proposed yesterday as a necessary consequence of quantum theory, which therefore would be approximate only to some extent which would be describable by quantum theory. And I have some hope that this might eliminate the singularities altogether. But this is not done. One thing I see, that is, it might be possible that beyond the structure of time which I have been describing and on which I have based all my considerations, there might be a different structure. It might be true that the future is factual while we don't know it. Perhaps there are true prophets. It might be true that our idea that the past is factual is a simplification and it is not so simple. These possibilities I have even considered in a book I wrote recently, Aufbau der Physik, in, uh, published in 1985, uh, uh, but uh, only in German so far. So I consider such possibilities, but I have not so far f felt tempted to go into them. To me to my second question, yeah. is, suppose we develop the artificial intelligence to the point so, yeah. artificial intelligence being yeah. computers, yeah. where these are communicating with each other and yeah. probably go through the revolution, but they don't bother to communicate to us about it because they're so intense. Yeah. <laughs> what would I say about that? <laughs> well, the first question is whether artificial intelligence is at all intelligent. Uh, I mean, it is certainly superior to our intelligence in the same way in which an automobile is superior to our way of motion if there is a good street, a good road. That means we have been able to develop instruments which are able to simulate those activities which we have been able to objectify. That's what we do. But I feel that what we call uh, intelligence in the case of a human being, which contains consciousness, I think this rests on a structure which is not even really studied of course, psychologists try to study it and ethologists try to study it. But so far, I would be quite prepared 
to make a bet that no instrument which has in artificial intelligence has anything like consciousness. And consciousness exists. It is there. Therefore, it is possible in nature. Again, I would say what I called reflection. Trying to find out what I did, what I thought. I think certainly might be built into computers as soon as we have well understood what it is. But I'm not so far convinced that we already know the trick. And in all these respects, I think that while I'm certain that a chess computer is now able to beat me very easily, while I have been playing chess not quite badly, uh, perhaps not yet able to beat Mr. Kasparov, but even that might happen in the end. But this is only because playing chess is an objectified uh, behavior. While real human contact, for instance, human intersubjectivity, which was mentioned before, depends on what we call emotional elements, depends on kinds of information which are not expressed in statements which are answers to yes-no questions. And for that reason, I still think I'm not so much afraid, nor, on the other hand, hopeful with respect to artificial intelligence for overcoming human thought. Well, I'm not saying it is impossible, but so far I don't see it. Perhaps one last question. Maybe a question that's of interest for the, for the audience uh, at large. Since you have some familiarity with the science systems both in Europe and in the United States, do you feel that there, <clears throat> that there is a particular philosophy of science that yields a higher scientific productivity that leads to more productive scientific research, scientific um, doing. Where would you what expect I'm, it what to I'm trying to appeal to is the fact I myself am from Germany and I see a yes. lot more productive work in the social sciences which which are well, nice I know, okay. in the United States cool. than in Germany. And That's I have cool. some hunch that has to that, that has to do with the empiricist a stronger and there is a spend that is yeah, exists yeah, here yeah. in the United States. Higher level of naivety. I mean, this is not the whole answer. Uh, but, <laughs> no, I mean, the point is this. Uh, these things depend to a very large extent on history. Uh, when I was young, Every young American physicist, if he was good enough, went to Europe, either if he was an experimentalist, preferably to England, and if he was a theorist, preferably to Germany. When I was a little bit older, after the Second World War, every young German physicist went to America in order to learn either experiments or theory, which means that it is not clearly the different culture which makes the advantage. There are other conditions too. And one of the people who did most to destroy the German superiority which existed before was certainly Adolf Hitler. So uh, it is not easy to say that a certain culture is better for certain activities than another one. But after having said that, I would say the empiricist tradition, which is certainly very strong in this country, has been very good for promoting the strong, uh, intense activity in the fields of which we have been speaking. Social sciences in the time of Max Weber were quite good in Germany, very good even. But this has been lost somehow and Today, it is very difficult to re-establish that. And so, I fully admit that today, America is foremost in nearly all scientists in the world, science in, sciences in the world. Only I would say this was so with Germany, perhaps, 
in the eight and of the 19th century, and even when I was young and I was studying in the 20s, Germany was, was quite good, and Germany will never return to that high level, uh, internationally seen. And who knows, perhaps 100 years from now or 70 years from now, China, China might be in the same position in which America finds itself today. That depends on developments which are very hard to judge. Uh, now, the philosophical reflection which I have offered here, it is true, is more a continental European tradition than a British or American tradition. But still, there are very good philosophers in these places too. And if I just mention one who was certainly British and certainly finally lived in America, it was Whitehead who was a philosopher very similar to the way in which I have been argue, arguing. So again, the national culture doesn't determine things completely. But at present, I can just tell, certainly you were right to come to America for the studies you do. <laughs> Thank you, Professor.